applications of N2L. And I think this is when it starts to get really awesome. So let's go look at that. So the goal here is as follows. We're gonna look at an object. So by looking at an object's motion, we will determine the um, forces that cause this motion. So ultimately, we want to look at motion again, but this time in the language of forces. So you're going to see that there are two cases. Case number one, we're going to talk about force-free motion. Or we can also call this equilibrium. That's our first case here. So what do we mean by equilibrium? Whenever we have force-free motion or equilibrium, that implies that our states of motion is zero acceleration. But if I have a state of motion of rest, this is known as static equilibrium. Or if I'm moving at constant velocity, this is known as kinetic equilibrium. So there's two subsets of this thing here. Okay, so here we go. What does it mean to be in a zero acceleration state of motion? So according to Newton's second law here, if the acceleration is zero, note this is a vector. This implies that the net force is equal to zero. And of course the net force is equal to mass times the acceleration. What this tells us here though, is it tells us this, that the net force, as we've said before here, the net force with the vector is the sum of forces acting on an object, right? Acting on an object. Because this is a vector, what this really tells us here is it tells us here that when I write this thing called the net force, it's really a vector equation. And since this is zero, this implies here that there is the net force in the x direction that must be zero. There's the net force in the y direction that must be zero. And if these guys are zero, it has a very specific meaning. What this says here is that that we that it says here is that we sum all of the forces in the x direction, which means I'm going to collect get a collection of forces that point to the right, minus point to the left. And this combination must be zero. I could say the same thing for the y ones. If I look at the vertical forces, the only way they could be zero here is if all of the forces up must equal all of the forces down. They have to be zero. So in other words, we can summarize this thing. What you're seeing here is that it's saying very, very critically here that, check this out, the forces to the right must all equal the forces to the left. And the forces up must equal the forces down. So in order to be in a zero acceleration state of motion, these forces 
must what? We then say that force free motion implies at least two opposing forces must balance out. So in order to be in equilibrium, in order to be in force-free motion, in order to be in an a zero acceleration state, the forces to the left must balance the forces to the right. The forces up must, must balance the forces down. That's what Newton's second law is telling us right there about the forces here. So what I wanna do here is that I wanna go look at some examples to give you a sense of them. And I wanna look at two cases here, right? So if I look at the example here, the first thing that we wanna talk about is that we wanna talk about a static block. on a tabletop. So what do I know about this? Well, let's draw a picture. So you could imagine that I, you know what? I'm gonna bring this down lower. So then I have my table. So with this table, what I'm gonna do here is that I'm gonna put in a block. And here's my block. So what do I know about this block? Well, it's a static block. What do I mean by a static block? What that's telling me here, static means that the acceleration is zero. Wait a minute, if the acceleration is zero, the net force is zero. So that means I have to have a minimum of two this implies that I have two opposing forces balancing out. So when I look at this thing, what I note here is that there's the force of the table. What do we call the force of the table? We call it the normal force. So then pushing up is the normal force of the table, right? This is the table force. And downwards, I have another force. In this case, it's the force of gravity here. And these two forces must be exactly equal. So according to Newton's second law, note that in this case here, there are no forces in the x direction, right? So there's no X forces. If there's no X forces, then it's really zero equals to zero. But if I sum the forces in the Y direction and I need a coordinate system to do this, what I'm gonna do here is that I'm gonna call up positive, down negative. So then according to this rule here, I have a force called what? I have a normal force. I have the force of gravity pointing where? In the negative direction. And because this is stationary, we know that that net force is equal to zero. So what this tells us then is that the normal force must equal the force of gravity. Those two forces must balance. That's what we mean by static equilibrium here. So, by the way, even though I didn't say that until the end, this is an example of static equilibrium or force-free motion. So I'm gonna be a little bit better on this next example and I'm gonna say immediately, how about we start with, uh, did I call it kinetic equilibrium or dynamic? I think I said dynamic equilibrium. Dynamic equilibrium. 
So if I have dynamic equilibrium, this tells me that I have a block sliding with constant velocity. So let's go look at this. So what I'm seeing here is that again, I, could ima I imagine here that I have my tabletop. So when I'm looking at my tabletop, I have my block. And that's the exact same block as before. Now, what I'm doing here is that I know that this block is moving at constant velocity because we know that's what's happening here. So what we're saying here is that if I start to look at this thing, if this thing is truly a constant, then it's in a state of zero acceleration. But if it's in a state of zero acceleration, its net force must also be zero. So, but this guy is a two dimensional problem, right? So this is, and the reason why is that when I look at this guy, I am now worried about the X and the Y motion here. So why is that happening? Well, if I look at the forces in the X direction, the only way this could be zero, if the forces to the right must equal the forces to the left. So in this case, if this block is sliding, then there has to be a force pushing it to the right. Let's say this is the force of my hand, and then there has to be an opposing force here. And this opposing force on a tabletop is likely friction. So when I look at that, these two forces must be equal and opposite. So if this is the, my direction that's positive and that's my direction that's negative, you could see that the force of my hand is gonna be positive direction and the force of friction is pointed in the negative direction. So these guys must be zero. So immediately what this tells us here is that the force of my hand must equal the frictional force, exactly what you would expect for a zero acceleration state of motion. But note, we've already talked about this. If I'm talking about static equilibrium in the y direction, then that means what? The up minus the down, which we already talked about, this has to be what? The normal minus the force of gravity. And of course, in order to be in this state of motion, these guys have to balance too. But note, I'm not bringing those into here, but that's what we're talking about. So here, this is dynamic equilibrium in the x direction, in the y direction, this is static equilibrium. And that's what Newton's second law is telling us. Okay. So now the next case we're going to go to is um, the, the situation of case two. In case two, we're going to talk about forced motion. And in forced motion, this is known as non-equilibrium motion. So anytime we talk about forced motion, I mean one of three things. Speeding up, slowing down, or turning. If you're doing one of these three things, that implies here that the acceleration is not equal to zero. And if the acceleration is not equal to zero, then the net force must not be equal to zero. The only way this could be true here is that if you have un balanced forces here. 
Okay. And so in this picture, we could imagine again our table scenario. And if you're thinking about the table scenario here, what you're imagining here is that I have a block. And this block here, in this case, we're going to say is being sped up by the hand. So that means we still have the force of friction right here, which has not changed. But now the force of the hand is larger than the force of friction. I have a situation of unbalanced forces here. So if I have unbalanced forces, then what this tells me here is that now if this block is moving in this direction here, then this means I have a net force in that direction. If I have a net force in that direction, I must be accelerating in that direction. That's what an unbalanced force does here. So what we want to do here is that we want to be a little bit more careful here because there's some real big misconceptions about Newton's second law that I really want to try to address this thing properly. So let's see if I can do this before my time ends here in five minutes. Let's be really, really careful. What do I mean by this here? I am accelerating. We know that this must be true. So what do I mean by this? What this means picture wise, it means that when I look at all of the forces in the X direction, I have the force to the right minus the force to the left. And this has to equal mass time acceleration, in this case, in the X direction. If I'm looking at the forces in the Y direction, then the force up minus the force down has to equal mass times acceleration in the Y direction. So question. What is mass times acceleration? In other words, is mass times acceleration a force? The answer is no. That's not what it is. What you're seeing here is that if I look at the some of the forces in the x direction, all of the forces are on the right here. Here's where all of the forces are at. Forces are on the left. And you might be saying, but wait a minute, I have this mass times acceleration term. I know that the units of force are Newtons on the left. So the units of on the right, mass times acceleration must be also a force. They are force units, but they are not forces. And the way to answer this question is that remember, what is the net force? What is mass times acceleration? This guy is what? This is the cause. That's what causes acceleration. This guy is what? Is the effect. So the term mass times acceleration is not a force. It's the effect of the net force. That's why it has the right units. But let's look at this thing in terms of vectors, though. If you look at this in terms of vectors, let's rewrite this equation. So this means here that the force to the right must equal what? The force to the left. But then there's this term, mass times acceleration. 
So what, what we know here is that these two forces are what? Unbalanced. So if you look at this in terms of lengths here, what you see here is that, let's say that this force is four squares. Let's say that this is the force to the right. And what you're finding here, the force to the left, let's say is two squares. So this will be the force to the left here. What mass times acceleration does here is that it's essentially telling you about the lengths of these guys. That means when I look at the length of the mass times acceleration, it has these guys all have to equal out so that these guys all have the proper length here. So what that means here is that when I subtract the right from the left, what's left over is mass times acceleration. So this mass times the acceleration is sort of like the equalizing factor. This time, what I want to do now is that I want to continue to look at applications of non-equilibrium motion. So I want to look at another application of um, non-equilibrium motion or non-equilibrium states. Okay. And this is more to give you a sense of what is really going on here. So like, how do a lot of people really think about Newton's second law? Well, what do we know about Newton's second law? Well, N2L tells us that the net force is equal to mass times acceleration. Now we know that we can rewrite this the, this acceleration is the change in velocity. So what we wanna do here is that most of the time when we talk about changes in velocity, the change in velocity is typically constant. It's really the time interval that varies. So in many situations, Delta V is actually a constant. But the time interval changes. Okay, the time interval changes. And what I mean by this is that I could have a small time that gives me a short time interval. In other words, you change the velocity very, very quickly. On the other hand, you could have a very long time interval. And this means that you change the velocity over a long period of time. So many physical situations that people talk about is something like this here. But if you look at this in terms of the net force here, think about what actually happens here. So I could think of two examples here. One example, you could imagine that in each of these situations, I'm gonna move this up a little bit higher. In each of these situations, you can see that I'm trying to draw the velocity the change in velocity to be exactly the same. So I can compare two situations with the long time interval versus a short time interval. So what happens? What we do here is that clearly that's a long time interval. And accordingly, this tells us that we'll have a smaller acceleration. A short time interval clearly shows us that we must have a higher acceleration. So in other words, right? If we talk about a long 
time, then we have a small acceleration. If we have a short time, then we have a large acceleration. And of course they do that, right? Because they're inversely proportional to, to each other. So according to Newton's second law then, if you have a force acting on you, then a large acceleration really means that you're gonna do what? You're gonna feel more net force. Here, a small acceleration means you're going to feel less F net acting on you. So they're really intimately connected to each other here. And so what I wanna do here is that I wanna go in and give you some examples of this thing. Now, again, these are examples that I've used in physics 11, even in my physics 10, but I think they're really good examples that really give you a sense of what is going on. Okay, so let's look at, I'll look at just maybe a, a couple of examples and then move on here. So one example, right? The obvious one that many people don't even think about is that we say this, suppose, You're driving a truck and the brakes go out. Like I even have to ask you this question, is it better to hit um, a Haystack, right? A haystack or a brick wall, right? What a shock, huh? So my question is this, by knowing a little bit of physics, you'll get a better handle on why this is the case. So let's look at this. So when I'm thinking about this here, right? I imagine that I have two trucks, right? They're both identical, but one of them is driving, both of them are driving the same speed, right? So that means we're looking at something like this, right? They're moving real fast, let's say. So in this scenario here, they have a very high speed. So maybe we have something like this here. And you know what I'm gonna do? Instead of redraw this, I'm just gonna copy it, which I know is gonna piss some of you guys off. But what we're gonna do here is that in the end, what actually has to happen? We wanna stop this truck. Whether I hit a haystack or a brick wall, we're gonna stop this truck no matter what. So when I stop this truck here, what we imagine here is that it has zero velocity, right? So now we're gonna stop this truck because now its speed is zero. I could do the exact same thing if I'm gonna hit something else here, right? So now you could imagine that I have the exact same scenario here, but this time it's not headed, it's, it's the exact same thing, but the big difference here is that I'll use this as a different colored truck. And in the end, I wanna stop this violet truck, just like I wanna stop this lime green truck. So what's the difference here? So what you're seeing here is that in each of these situations, we have the same speed. And in the end, both of these trucks have to come to rest here. But the big difference here is that here, this guy is a pile of hay, right? This guy's a haystack. Whereas in this situation here, 
what you have here is that you have a brick wall, right? So you're looking at these bricks here and you're gonna ask the silly question, you know, why is it better to hit a pile of hay than a brick wall? Well, according to Newton's second law here, what actually happens here? Well, if you hit the pile of hay, the special thing about the pile of hay, right? It's kind of all over the place, right? You have sort of like, you have this big mess, but the fact is, is that it stopped, right? Side down. The haystack has stopped. The truck and if it stopped the truck well we know that its speed here in this scenario here is it, it's going to look something it has to look like that on the other hand if the truck hits the brick wall you could imagine that in some sense you probably see this brick wall as what sort of like Right, the car probably afterwards looks like an accordion, right? With it's pretty much unrecognizable. I don't even know if a window would still be there, but either way, you have some situation like this, where of course, if you slam into this thing, you would expect a lot of, right, smoke and steam, and if not a fire occurring to actually look out something like that but wait a minute look at the change in speed they both came in at the same speed they both have the final speed that's exactly the same and what we say here is that the brick wall has what stopped the truck so in each of these scenarios here, what do we have? Well, according to Newton's second law, we have a very interesting scenario here because if I'm gonna compare hitting the haystack versus hitting the brick wall, <clears throat> what we say here is that in this scenario, what's really happening here? So when you hit the, the haystack, it takes a long time to stop. What we call this long time as we call it the contact time. So in this scenario, this thing right here is a long contact time. But wait a minute, from what we talked about, Newton's second law then says that according to this, if I have a long contact time, that automatically tells me that I have what? a small deceleration. But if I have a small deceleration, that means that I have a small net force acting on me. In other words, we say that we feel less in this collision. Whereas if you're hitting the brick wall, right, it takes a short time to stop. So then we could go through that same scenario here where now we have this little tiny time. So this is a short contact time. But a short contact time, according to Newton's second law, tells us that we have what? A huge deceleration. And if we have a huge deceleration, 
then the net force acting on us must be huge. So in this case, we say you feel more. And I think that this really sets up, you know, a process of thinking that regardless of what you're thinking about, if you're going to compare two scenarios, you have to think in the language of how big was the contact time, the acceleration, and therefore the net force. So you get this sort of like always connecting them. And by the way, you can put in a lot of applications to this thing here. You know, one of the coolest applications that has been floating around for many years here is these things that are, these are these air helmets. These air helmets are expensive. They're about four times as expensive of a regular helmet. In fact, you could even buy them through with your insurance company, which I think is really interesting. And what I wanna do here is that I wanna show you a video that's online that looks like this here. So I'm assuming that you could see my screen here. Now, <coughs> excuse me. And what you're seeing here is that you're gonna see this guy, he's riding his bike and he's literally going towards this wall here. Check this out. And I'll play it a, a, for a little bit of time, but not the whole time. Check this out. So you can see how the air helmet pops up, but now it's gonna go into slow motion right here. Oh, I thought it was. My bad. I thought I had the slow motion part of it here. Oh, I guess I missed it. There is a piece of slow motion someplace. Maybe it's right here. I think that's, I think I'll stop it right here. But you can see that what's actually happening in this situation. What you're seeing in this scenario here is that, what is the air helmet doing? So if I think about the air helmet, what it's telling us here is that there's an increase in contact time. But if you increase in contact time, now you're gonna have a small acceleration. But according to Newton's second law, then therefore you have a small net force acting on you. So therefore you feel less. I mean, there's so many situations that you could talk about this, right? There's a lot of situations. Think about jumping off a table, right? Another one, what about uh, jumping onto the ground. I mean, think about this. What do you do when you hit the ground? Right? People, right? I should put this in big words, right? Bend, right? They bend their knees. Why do they bend their knees? Because you increase contact time. Smaller acceleration, smaller net force, you feel less versus people, right? And this is what they call a soft landing. But what about people who do not bend their knees, right? You call those people dumbasses. That's what you call them. And in this case here, what do you find? It's a hard landing. And maybe earning you a trip to the, uh, to the emergency here, right? But the hard landing does what? It decreases contact time. Therefore, you have a large acceleration. Therefore, you have a large net force and 
it hurts like hell, right? That's what we mean by, you know, Newton's second law when we're talking about contact times. In each of those two cases, it's always the same. 